group that um, we promote sustainability in town and advocate um, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and um, activities that help build communities. So that's a little bit about what we're all about. We have uh, some trifold flyers here if you'd like to know a little more about us. And um, we also have a website at www.bolkenlocal.org and also on Facebook, so you can find out all about us. So this is um, Birgit De Weer. She is from Bedford. She's a beekeeper. She's author of Let Me Tell You About My Bees. Um, I will let you talk a little bit about yourself. I'm going to thank you very much for coming. I yeah, really appreciate it. Um, after um, her talk, feel free to ask questions. And also, um, Kelly has very graciously put out some books that the library has on beekeeping. If anyone is interested in any, though, they have to be checked out through the library. But just so you know, we can source them out. So, okay, well, thank you. I'm so glad to see everybody here. Um, I love to talk about honeybees. So I became a beekeeper about 25 years ago. I, I used to work many years at MIT as a chemist, and then my daughter was born, and I decided to become a full-time mother, and somebody gave me a jar of bees, uh, a jar of honey, and it had sort of a homemade label, and I said, where did you get the honey from? And I said, and she said, uh, from my bees, and she has bees in Cambridge. And I thought, she can have bees in Cambridge. I certainly can have bees in my yard in the center of Bedford. So, uh, and this is what I did, and I must say it was the biggest stroke of luck to get the star of honey from this uh, acquaintance of mine, because uh, honeybees have uh, given me tremendous amount of joy, uh, and I like to impart some of this onto you, and maybe make a beekeeper out of you. So, um, before I get into my slides talking about um, the year in the life of our honey colony and its beekeeper, um, I want to give you a little beekeeper of honeybee 101. You know, remember probably lots of it from school, but um, so honeybees are social insects. They live in large colonies. In the summertime, the colonies are about 60,000 bees strong. They uh, build their nest out of wax, and they like to uh, build their nest uh, in the woods in hollow trees. That is their favorite place. And um, people have known for hundreds and thousands of years, in fact, since the Stone Ages, 12,000 years ago, it was known already that honeybees made honey. And people would go on a bee hunt to find these uh, honeybee trees. And here you see, uh, courtesy of Scientific American, maybe we can shut off a couple of lights here. Um, can just the front lights maybe? Well, well, maybe okay. in the back? Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Um, so this is how they live in hollow trees, and they build slabs of honeycomb uh, inside hollow trees. So people have known for this long time that honeybees make honey, and honey used to be the only sweet stuff around. Um, people didn't have the sugar we have not nowadays, so whenever they wanted to have something sweet, people would go to find these honeybee uh, trees, and they would go on a bee hunt. They follow a bee from its flower to its nest in the hollow tree, and then they would mark that tree with their name and their sign and, sign, and that was their tree. Nobody else was allowed to take honey from it. It was something very precious for the ancient villages to know where there was a honeybee tree in the woods. Um, and I go to the schools and tell the kids, anybody caught stealing honey from a honeybee tree was punished very badly. In the Middle Ages, you had your hand chopped off. No. <laughs> so, um, here you can see a uh, uh, picture which was found in a, a Spanish cave, uh, which was made 12,000 years ago, um, showing a bee hunter climbing up uh, the tree, robbing the bees of the honey. And, um, so over the years, thousands and thousands of years, out of bee hunters became beekeepers. And that is what we are now. Uh, we keep bees um, in, not in trees anymore, even though in some places of Africa you have uh, bees in tree trunks, 
chimpanzees and chitons. Nowadays, our bee nests, our colonies live in, if they don't live in hollow trees around, the keepers keep their colonies in these boxes. And I will tell you uh, about my beekeeping from January all the way through the summer to the fall to the honey harvest. So this is what my bees look like, honey bee colonies look like uh, in January. Um, the queen will stop laying eggs um, in December when the weather gets very cold. The uh, bees cluster around the queen and they keep that cluster warm, uh, 93 degrees, even though the outside temperatures are freezing. Um, in January, I put a little tarp around uh, the bees to protect them from uh, the wind. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is my, my house here, these are my colonies, uh, quite close. Um, on a warm day in January, um, the bees will fly out, go on a candy flight. They cluster around the queen and fan their wings, getting energy from eating honey. And honey is really their winter food. Uh, to, to be able to fan using their wing muscles to generate heat to keep the colony alive during the winter. Now, two thirds of the colony will die in the winter time. Eating honey, of course, they need to defecate. They don't do this inside the hive. They fly out on a sunny day, uh, moderately warmish day, even in January, uh, to defecate and to find these dead bees in the snow is a delight for me as a beekeeper because I know those bees came from where there were lots of live bees around. So there, there are some bees able to fly out. They don't make it all back home, but there they are. They were flying. And here you see the bee poop in the snow. And if you have laundry on the laundry line, you might see those yellow little specks on your laundry uh, from the honeybees flying out on their cleansing flight. Lots of lots of dead bees on a warmish day in January. Two thirds will die, so I will sort of get rid of much of those piles of dead bees to, to enable the bees to circulate the air so that it's not stuck, uh, plugged up their, their ventilation areas. And then uh, in February, I'm starting to be concerned whether the bees have enough honey to sustain them through the winter, through the rest of the winter. And um, on a warm day, I peek in and um, say, oh, they might need a little honey, they are running low. So I feed them sugar syrup, the consistency of nectar. And I put the sugar syrup in these glass bottles, and the bottles have a lid of holes. And I turn the bottles over, and uh, a, a there's a, I will show you later what a hive looks like. But there's a cover, the inner cover we call it, which has an opening that you put this bottle upside down over this opening and the bees go through there and suck the sugar syrup from the bottle and bring it to their nest. Well, spring is coming, the mothers are out with their babies and the joggers are out and the first blossoms in the springtime I see uh, in my yard are uh, the snowdrops. And it's, uh, if you have snowdrops around in your yard or in your neighbor's yard, go and check them out for honeybees on a warm day in the end of February. It's wonderful. The queen will start, will start laying just about now. She starts laying eggs and the larva will need a lot of protein. So you will see bees harvesting or foraging for pollen. Uh, in those uh, snowdrops. Then, and then the first bees bringing in the pollen. I, I, I just, as a beekeeper, it's the best thing in the spring for me. And everybody in, in the street, oh, there it says the bees are bringing in the pollen. Spring is here, yeah! <laughs> so here they are. They have some pollen, they have some folds on their hind legs, and they stuff that pollen down those folds. Uh, we would call it the pollen baskets. And here, see, the pollen baskets are full of pollen. It's a great, great sight. Uh, 
All bees have pollen baskets. Um, uh, wasps don't. So that's one difference between wasps and bees. And I will tell you more differences as I'm talking to you. Some of the, uh, they not only bring it from the um, small drops, but at that time also the maple start blooming. The early maple trees are the, the uh, swamp maples and so, silver maples. And if the days are somewhat warmish, which allow then the bees to fly up into the heights of these trees, uh, uh, this is very nice because they get a lot of uh, pollen and nectar also from those blossoms of the maple trees. And you see my hand is all yellow from the, from the pollen. Some of the bees, I don't know whether you can see, but they are, have pollen all over themselves. And these are the bees who come from the skunk cabbage. Um, and skunk cabbage is a very interesting plant. You probably know them, the cabbage type of leaves and everything. Oh, skunk. I never smelled skunk cabbage. I don't know why it's called skunk cabbage. They must have a smell at one point, but I don't never ever smell it. Um, the blossoms of the skunk cabbage are very interesting. They are these chalices. Here we go. They are like a chalice. They are a little bit away from the uh, leaves of the skunk cabbage, and inside the chalice is a <coughs> ball studded with tiny little blossoms. And the bees, on a warmish day at the beginning of March, they will be able to fly to these skunk cabbages, warm up in the hollow of these blossoms, and then get the pollen nectar and fly back home. Skunk cabbage is also interesting because its metabolism generates heat, heat by itself also, not only through the sun, but um, its meta metabolism uh, generates heat as well. Nice plant to have around. Oh, here's Barney, our dog. He sits, almost sits next to, uh, on top of the only crocus in that little patch there. <laughs> Crocuses are another wonderful place for you to go around, hunker down, and check whether you see honeybees in the crocuses. Uh, it, it's just, I, I just go and, ah, oh, the name I need has to be a feed of crocuses. It's great to see the crocuses and the honeybees. Um, 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 pussy bills. Nice to have, and I planted some. You don't need to have all these uh, plants in your yard. The bees fly two miles radius back and forth to flowers. So, uh, but for me, I planted some pussy willows in my yard for the bees not to have to fly that far. And I mean, these sometimes still rather cold days in the early springtime. So now it's end of March, and uh, I'm really curious to see. Uh, how the bees uh, have been doing, whether they have plenty of food, whether uh, the queen has started laying, okay, and so forth. So I open the hive, I, I take the top cover out, then the inner cover, I will show you a schematic of a hive, of a modern hive. So here you have the, 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 the bottom board, the hive stand, the bottom board. Then you have two uh, fairly large boxes, like each box is like two bread boxes, kind of a, the, the uh, volume of it. Um, and each box has 10 frames, wooden frames, with honeycombs built in. The bees, we entice the bees to build the honeycomb within the confines of wooden frames. And I will tell you, show you later a slide uh, of what that means. So there are 10 honeycomb frames in each of these boxes. Um, and that is nice because in honeybee trees, you have to grab the honeycomb and destroy the nest and make the bees very angry and uh, kill probably a lot of bees, push a lot of bees. But with this modern hive, all you do is you, you, you pull the honeycomb out. And if you do it gently, you barely disturb the bees. Um, you don't barely, you're careful not to kill any. <laughs> there is very, and you can observe the bees and can inspect the hive um, by just manipulating uh, these honeycomb uh, frames. So you have two boxes of 10 frames like this, 
And then on top, some beekeepers uh, put a queen excluder above this, because this is where the brood lives in these two boxes. Uh, this is where the queen and the colony lives. Uh, and so on top of this, we put a queen excluder, which is a grate, which is, the prongs are too narrow for the beam to slip through, to go up into these boxes, because these boxes, we beekeepers add during the course of the summer, as the bees bring in more and more nectar and nectar, as the sun is shining, as more and more flowers are blooming, they fill up that space pretty soon. And the beekeepers, the art of beekeeping is it to now add more space to this colony so the workers can deposit the extra nectar up in these uh, supers, we call it. And the queen cannot go in there through the queen excluder because of the queen excluder to lay eggs. So uh, this is. So this is what a uh, modern colony looks like. And then you have the um, inner cover, which is a, has an opening in the middle where we put the syrup uh, upside down the bottle uh, above and then the outer cover. So this is what a modern hive looks like. So I inspect the hive. Middle to end of March, see what it looks like. And this is a wonderful, example of a honeycomb full of pollen. All these yellow things are pollen. Some of some nectar cells, but most of it pollen. Different plants have different color pollen. Of course the pollen, if you look at it under the microscope, they all look different. Very interesting. If you have a microscope hanging around your house someplace, put some pollen on a little glass disc and, and, and look at them. They're very interesting shapes. Um, and forms pollen have different colors. Pollen is the protein source of honeybees. Um, the larva, the queen lays an egg. So, so the colony consists out of one female, which is the queen. She's in charge of laying the eggs. Then there are the drones, which are the males of the colony. They are in charge of their only job is it to mate with the queen, that's all they do. Uh, and there are about uh, 500 or so drones in each colony of honeybees. Then the rest of the colonies, of course, are the worker bees. And they are called workers because they have all the jobs. And they grow from one job into the next. They start out being nurse bees, those are the ones who feed the young. Then they become cleaners. Those are the ones who shove out anything which doesn't belong. Little pieces of this, little piece of... Every morning I come to my hive, I see a little pile of junk in front of the hive. The cleaners have cleaned the hive. Then they get the next job a few days later. They become builders. At that time of their lives, they develop wax glands in their body. And the wax comes out of the side of their body in shape of those tiny little round things. So they take their front legs and they shape it and mold it into the shape of honeycomb. And then the last job they have, or then they become guard bees. And then the last job is the job of the field bees. And those are the honeybees you see out on the flowers. Those are the ones who bring in the food for the colony and the food for the colony's pollen and nectar from the flowers. And pollen is the protein uh, source for the bees. When the queen lays an egg, after three days, we hatch a larva, which is a little maggot. And that larva will first get fed royal jelly, which is a special diet, a special um, uh, uh, substance the nurse bees make. Very rich, very nutritious um, uh, uh, diet. And then, after three days of royal jelly, the larva will get fed pollen and honey. And so, and then the larva will grow bigger and bigger, and then it goes into the pupa stage. And then the pupa, the larva metamorphosis, go into metamorphosis <laughs> into a, a bee. So, here, yeah, this is a beautiful frame of 
Holland for June. So here you have a beautiful frame of wood. And the bees are very efficient. So here you have the chrysalis, the pupa stage of the bull, the pupa stage of the uh, of worker bees is this. The pupa stage of drones are these here, little bullet shape. Um, so the pupa, the, the changing from the larva to the bee happens in the pupa stage, and the pupa stage has the wax uh, cells covered. So the, this change happens beneath the cover in these cells. And then since the larva need a lot of protein, they put the protein around the area of the brood. You see the ring of pollen here. And then beyond that is honey. And honey is the food for energy. And the honey, when the honey is ripe and done, the bees put a layer of wax over the honey. And this is what you see here. Uh, ripe, ready-made honey. Not yet that. So that is a beautiful, healthy-looking uh, frame of food. And we beekeepers look for a good frame like this because that is a good judgment or good, um, we get a good sense of the health of the colony if we have a healthy brood pattern like this. Sometimes the brood pattern has lots of holes in it and you see, uh, look for dead larva and there's a, you right away know there's something wrong with that colony, but this is a beautiful, healthy, uh, train of wood. And then, of course, there are, um, since there are not that many bees in the springtime, I mean, like two thirds will die, so there might be only 20,000 bees in March uh, in the colony, so you easily have a chance to see the queen. And here you see, here's the queen. And she's constantly prodded and touched by the workers who tend to her, their job is to tend to the queen. And they feed her, they prod her, they touch her, they carry the queen's pheromone all through the hive. And as long as the pheromones are present in the hive, the workers will know the bee, the queen is alive. If the pheromone of the queen, the concentration of the pheromones of the queen will go down in the hive, the workers right away know, oops, there's something the matter with the queen. The queen is sick or the queen will die. They right away make a new queen. And the way they make it is they start feeding. They take a worker larva and feed that larva only royal jelly. No pollen, no honey, only royal jelly. From that they become a queen. So it's only the amount of royal jelly a worker larva receives which determines whether a queen or a worker will become of it. And we don't know how that works. It's, it's, it's a mystery. So I tell the kids always in school, when I go to school, I tell the children about honeybees, you can study this. You become a researcher in insects, and you can study this, and you find out why. Now, the season goes on. Forsythia, I never have seen bees, honeybees in Forsythia. Uh, my guess is that the, the, the nectar is not as desirable. There are many, many, many other <coughs> blossoms around the bloom of the Forsythia, which are much more uh, attractive for honeybees. For example, my neighbor's Chinese cherry tree. Every year, like a clockwork, my neighbor comes to me and says, Daddy, you're beside my cherry tree again. Great. And they get a lot of nectar from this uh, Chinese cherry tree. And in the meanwhile, though, I'm eyeing my apple tree because the, apple tree, the bloom of the apple trees is the start of the first major nectar flow, flow here. Uh, in our union area. Um, and I have to make sure that I give the bees lots of room, that they uh, have lots of room to deposit all this extra, extra nectar. Because by now, 
The queen has been starting, has started laying eggs more and more and more and more. She's almost at the height of her egg laying. She lays about 2,000 eggs every day during the summertime. So it is now um, end of April. Uh, the queen is almost there with it. And lots of bees have become of all these eggs. The feed bees have been brought in. All that pollen and nectar, the original hive where the queen lives with her colony, is getting fuller and fuller and fuller. And if the beekeeper doesn't do anything about it and doesn't pay attention, then this colony will swarm. So the art of beekeeping is it really to prevent, one of the arts of beekeeping is it, to prevent the colony from swarming. And swarming means that the queen will leave with half of the colony to find a different nest. Before she leaves, they make a new queen. And just before uh, the new queen hatches, the old queen leaves with her swarm. So the beekeeper loses half of a colony. And that is very tough because um, you need a lot. Beekeepers try to prevent the swarming because you don't get a lot of honey from a colony which has swarmed. Because you need a lot of bees to bring in all that extra nectar to make honey. We beekeepers in a good year make 50 pounds of honey of each colony. Now, to make one teaspoon of honey, the bees have to collect nectar of 150 trips back and forth to flowers to make one teaspoon of honey. In other words, the bees have to fly the distance of twice around the earth, the distance, collectively, to make, bring in the nectar to make one pound of honey. It's an incredible feat they are doing. And, and you only can do this if you have a really full, big, um, lots of bees, 60,000 bees, or more than 60,000 bees in a colony of honeybees. Then, you, then they will be able to do this. They need 70 pounds of honey to survive the winter, and all the extra honey we beekeepers can harvest. So we beekeepers try to prevent the swarm. So, uh, we are eyeing the apple trees, so when they start uh, blooming. But before the apple trees are blooming, a very important other blossom, a plant is blooming, and that is, <coughs> those are the dandelions. Dandelions are a very important nectar source. In fact, dandelions have the most nectar of all the blossoms which are in bloom at the time of their bloom. So, I'm a big proponent of dandelions, <laughs> as you can imagine. And as I'm going to garden clubs, um, as I'm going to, talking to you, I like to impart on you the idea of having not a manicured lawn. That your lawn has all kinds of other things growing in it. Uh, that it has dandelions growing in it. That it has clovers growing in it. That it has a yoga growing in it. Um, first of all, you don't need any pesticides for this. And also, you don't need any, any, as much water to water your lawn. Because my lawn, when, I, when we, I walk down my street, I look at my lawn, it's green. That's all I want. But when you look closely, there are all kinds of things growing in it. So, uh, dandelions are a very important nectar source. Lots of it. So, when the dandelions are in bloom, I right away add more boxes, extra boxes, we call them supers, on top of the brood nest of the colony too. Because I know if the weather just plays along with me, if there's sun, if there's rain at night to replenish the nectar, next day sun again, um, I will need a lot of space for the bees to deposit this nectar. And here the apples are in bloom, wonderful and the bees will be in them. But here, the colony swarmed on me. You see up there? Sometimes beekeepers, I in this case, was too late. 
if I'm just a little late giving the room, once the workers have it in their head to swarm, you cannot get them out of it. They are just programmed. We swarm. Never mind the room she put on top of it. They swarm. And so here, this colony was gone. I couldn't get it. But here's another colony, uh, another swarm I caught. And if you see, this is a hemlock hedge here. And you see the trunk here of a hemlock tree? Mm -hmm. And compared to this trunk of the hemlock, this is all bees. It's all along this trunk. It is really a trunk like this, but this is all bees. So I, I went there with my brush and brush the bucket and then jump on the hide and put the bucket in it and back, wash the more. So I could capture that swarm, but of course, I was hoping that the queen was in my collection of um, rushing the colony into the bucket. So and the way I determined that the queen is among these bees and not still up there, I watched the bees which spilled on the ground. And if I see those bees spilled on the ground, crawl like the dickens into the hive, I know the queen is there. And there are lots of fanning bees here, fanning, 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 Telling the pheromone of the queen, which inside indeed there, to tell the bees, come on, we are here, the queen is here, the all call. If I see the bees sort of aimlessly walking around and then take off again, the queen is still up there. So it, it is so much fun to watch this bee. If you know about these honeybees, you can deal with them like a bunch of cattle. It's, it's really great. So there it is. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, this is for my car. Um, this is Nancy. Um, she used to have a store in Woburn, great beekeeper, and she, uh, you would go there and you would buy whatever you wanted to buy, but you would get stuck there for the whole morning talking bees because there would beekeepers would come there and everybody would exchange experiences and uh, talk bees, this is great. Now this gentleman is there to buy queens. Because sometimes it's more advantageous to buy the queen instead of letting the bees make the queen. Because when the bees make the queen, you lose a lot of egg, egg laying capacity. Because you have to wait for the, uh, the, 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 the eggs to hatch and to grow, and then the filming the bees, the hatch bees going through all these jobs, and then finally they become field bees, and those are the ones that. So it takes like six weeks. To, to, to get this cycle going again. So many beekeepers say, forget this, I buy a queen. And also you can buy then genetically good queens, um, uh, which have certain traits, uh, the newest or the, the latest uh, desire for a good queen would be a hygienic queen, a queen which can brush off mites you probably have heard of the mite invasion like 15 years ago, the Mazawa mite started the nemesis of our bees. It's a little um, uh, microorganism which uh, feeds off the blood of the uh, bees and also mostly of the brood, uh, of the drone brood of the bees. And uh, the bees have been fighting these mites for many, many years. And this is one of the things why we have so much trouble with our bees because if an organism has to fight so much all the time and all the time, your resistance against other invading uh, microorganisms goes down. So this is one of the reasons uh, why we have so much trouble um, with the bees. And then, of course, on top of it are the pesticides we are using. And um, ask me later about this because I can go on. So um, Lisa, I'd like to tell you about the pesticides. So, um, He's buying a queen, and the queen comes in little cages, and each little cage has a couple of uh, nurse bees in it to feed the queen, and the cages are plucked up with a little bit of marshmallow, and here you see this little bit of marshmallow. This is the queen. So now, uh, now this is the cage. So here it goes. Here, here's a little marshmallow here. Yeah. 
and we have a piece in it, and you don't quite see it. But, so we need keepers, so there's no queen in the collar. I mean, you have to take the old queen out, if the queen is too old, you decide you have to buy a new queen to put it. So you have to take the old queen out, or if you have to, discovered that your hive is queenless, well, you, know, you get a new queen quickly. So, um, so there's no queen in the hive. So, but you cannot just plump that queen in there because the bees would go right away and kill her. Um, they have to slowly get used to the pheromone of that new queen. So we introduce new queens in these little cages. And we sort of put it in. Oh no, this is also so we put the cage in, and the time it takes for the workers to eat their way through that piece of marshmallow, it's about the time the bees need to get used to the scent of the new queen. So when they finally the marshmallow has, has a hole in it, the queen can, can come out, uh, the workers of the colony are used to the scent of the new queen and they don't kill them. You also can buy, when you decide to become a new beekeeper, which I highly encourage you to become, um, you buy a package of bees. And there, um, it's a, like an artificial swarm, there's a queen inside there, and it's about three pounds of bees, about 10,000, 15,000 bees. And you pull them into the hive, and the queen comes out, you know, and starts laying, and pretty soon you have a beautiful new colony. Uh, of honeybees. Now this is um, how we entice the bees to build the honeycomb within the confines of these wooden frames. So here's the wooden frame. But beekeeping, the only thing about beekeeping is that you have to use hammer and nails and, uh, and uh, give me a needle and thread. I like it, but, but hammer and nails, this is the only thing which I'm not very fond of, but, but you have to do it. So. You get these, it's all pre, you assemble it, it's all prefab, but you assemble the, heart, the, the frames, you bang the nails and make the frame, and then, and then you put this sheet of wax, we call it foundation. It's beeswax, a sheet of beeswax, and it has the shape of the honeycomb cells embossed in it. <coughs> and the bees find that shape, and they build the honeycomb above these shapes in the um, uh, foundation. So this is a very efficient way of uh, making new honeycomb. Now here's my daughter. She just had a baby, so this is a long time ago. <laughs> yes, she is a long time and she keeps saying, Mom, we have to mow the lawn. All the neighbors have mowed the lawn. I said, away, I first want the bees to uh, get the nectar from the ajuga because my lawn has a lot of fill over the ground and the bees love it and I hate to mow the lawn until the, some of the ajuga is, is uh, done blooming and then finally I said okay let's mow it any more around it and make a nice pattern and everything was many of the patches still growing. Um, the season goes on, the white plum trees if you see those in the woods, check out whether you see honeybees in them. Um, and this is what my garden looks like um, in June. We, here are my three colors at that time. I usually try to have four. And here's where we have our barbecues. We play, you know, badminton in the back. We never get bothered by honeybees, by the honeybees. Uh, if you have second thoughts of having, having a, a colony or two or three or four in the back of your yard, go ahead. They all only fly to flowers. They don't come to your food. Um, what comes to your food are the wasps, the yellow jackets, which is a different story. Uh, wasps are meat eaters. They come to your uh, hot dogs and take a bite from your hot dog. Um, but they are not upset with you. They are not aggressive when they come to your food. The only time they are aggressive is when you are too close to their nest. They don't like it. They get very, they are very protective of their nests. 
So that's why many people say, oh, I'm allergic against bees, but what they really are saying is they're allergic against wasps. And you come much more easy in contact with uh, wasps because they have that nest in the ground, they have it hidden beyond the eaves of your garage door, they have it in your compass pot. So you, you much easier have an accident and an encounter with wasp, angry wasps, if you get too close to a wasp nest. Uh, so, but honeybees, um, they don't come to the before. The only time they might come if you have a warm, uh, late fall day and you want to have a picnic, uh, all the flowers are gone, and the bees are still flying, they might come to your, your cake, uh, the honeybees, at that time. But if there are flowers around, they won't bother. They, they, they don't come to you. Honeybees also need water, so you always have to have a little, um, as a beekeeper, I make sure I have a little water puddle someplace. That might be the only time that you uh, get stung by a honeybee if you come out of a swimming pool and the grass is wet around it and bees get their water from it and you might step into her. Or you might step into a honeybee if you run barefoot through a uh, soccer field where there's a lot of clover in bloom and so by accident you might. So if you get stung by a honeybee, honeybees can only sting you once. So they have a little hook at the end of the stinger. And when they sting you, that stinger will stay stuck in your skin and then they fly off and part of their back gets ripped away and they cannot live without it and they fall into the grass and die. But the stinger will be in your skin. Now this is important. On that stinger is still the venom back attached to it. It's this little bubble which has the stuff inside which makes you itch and hurt. Now you don't want, and even though the bee is long gone, this little venom bag will pump more of that venom into you, making you itch and hurt more, so you don't want this to happen. So get rid of that stinger quickly. But don't pull the stinger out, because you would grab that stinger by the venom bag and press more venom into you. So what you do is you take your fingernail and scratch it out. Scratch, scratch, scratch. And then you can go in the kitchen, throw a paper towel with, with vinegar <coughs> or ammonia or <coughs> maybe you have some other remedies. I like vinegar. It, it helps, it draws the venom out. That's <coughs> it. Yes, sure. uh, so wasps can sting you more than once. They don't have this little hook at the end of the stinger, So they can go wham, wham, wham and they fly off live happily ever after. <laughs> so now people also say I'm allergic against bees. I think they mostly say, mean really to say that they are allergic against wasps. So, when you get stung by something and it hurts a lot, first check whether you see a sting in your skin. If you do, you got stung by a skin, you scratch it out and stretch. Now, your body will react to that sting, obviously. So you swell up a little, that's fine. Put some vinegar on it first and then ice and so on. Sometimes you swell up a lot. That's fine too. The only time it's not okay is if you not only swell up where you got stung, but all of a sudden your arms <coughs> start swelling up, your throat, you get a rash all over, that is not okay. That means your body overreacts. That means you are allergic against those stings and then you have to see a doctor quickly and the doctor will give you adrenaline and so on. So, uh, but you have to see a doctor quickly. So, let's see, water. Oh yeah, so once a year, uh, once a month, we meet, uh, uh, I'm Middlesex County, you're Worcester County. Worcester County is a great beekeeper, so it's one of the oldest beekeepers associations uh, in the country. Um, uh, lots of beekeepers, so if you want to become a beekeeper, just find out when their meetings are. And we love to have people come and, and just join and have some cookies and punch in the summer in the garden and then opening a hive and watch it. Um, it's very nice. So I'm Middlesex County, so we also have our meetings and um, we, we open a hive and talk about uh, honeybees and um, I will tell you later, but I will say, yeah, this guy, oh, let me open a hive. He doesn't even bother putting on a veil or gloves or no, no. Then after I say, oh, the bees are getting a little antsy, they close the hive. <laughs> so um, uh, this is a real, real old time right here. But um, I will show you in a minute uh, the perfect area when you uh, open a hive you need. So poppies, great plan to have. Honeybees love to go to poppies. So we had one big uh, 
uh, nectar flow, which were the fruit trees, the apple trees. I was watching that I had enough room and I was looking at the sun, great, big nectar flow, probably great for honey making so far. He's still up there in the stores. The next big nectar flow is the black locust tree. And you have uh, the um, robinia, uh, so the Latin uh, um, name for it, uh, black locust trees. And they are a great honey maker. They have these drooping flowers, like listeria flowers, but in white. And you see them all along 128, root 2. Uh, they are sort of a shrubby, weedy kind of bush, sometimes high trees. A great uh, uh, nectar provider, make beautiful honey, uh, very light uh, honey, um, very, very nice. So I make sure I have a lot of space added to my uh, um, honey colonies to uh, uh, accommodate the increased amount of nectar coming in. Um, then, great to have and to observe these on, um, are the white cherry trees. The bushes, the shrubby, weedy kind of bushes by the wayside. Um, great uh, nectar uh, blossoms. Then, I just love those rambler roses. The bees love them. Uh, and then after they are bloomed, they are bloomed, I cut them all down and then they grow up again and next year they are as high again and they have the beautiful flowers. They don't go as much to, uh, for the fox glove, um, but they love the rainbow roses. Uh, Catalpas, a great tree to observe all kinds of different types of bees. There are hundreds of different uh, uh, types of bees around. Honeybee is just one type of bees, but there are the bumblebees, there are the basic orchard bees, there are sometimes tiny, tiny, tiny little, they look like ants with wings, but no, they have pollen baskets full of pollen, they too belong to the family of the bees. Um, any insect you see with full pollen baskets, those insects belong to the family of the bees. So here you see the cacalpus. On a warm summer's day, you stand under uh, the cacalpus, and you, you might hear lots of buzzing. And you look and you see all these different types of bees uh, in the blossoms getting at uh, the next time. Beautiful blossom. <coughs> And so, so fruit trees, one nectar flow, um, black locust, the second nectar flow, and now comes the third nectar flow, big, big nectar flow. This is the uh, bloom of linden trees, of linden and basswood. Wonderful. And I, as a beekeeper, keep off because I know where all these trees are. And when I walk my dog, I look at these trees. Oh, there's a black locust. Wow, I didn't see that last year. There's a Oh, and so you, you, and you know where these trees are, and then before they bloom, you walk by and say, it's not blooming quite yet. Next week, it's going to bloom. Make sure that I have extra space added to the, the columns. Uh, Linens make a wonderful nectar, and I, when I harvest honey, I try to keep, I know when I harvest shortly after the linen or during the linen bloom, I know there's a lot of nectar from lemon tree in that particular batch of honey. Uh, many beekeepers harvest all the way at the end of the season. I like to harvest in between to get these different flavors. And each honey has a has a different flavor. You know, the, the, the early summer honey has a very, I want to say pointy, very distinct, pointy kind of taste, while the late summer honey has sort of a rounded more uh, aroma taste. So anyway, linen, very, very nice honey from the linen trees. And also, the later in the season, the earlier in the season, the lighter is the honey. So the early summer honey is light and then it got darker, 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 and then in the fall, it becomes um, really amber, dark amber <coughs> color. Um, honeysuckle, Honeybees cannot get at the nectar source, but sometimes they are really eager to get it and they even drill little holes on the side to, to get at the nectar of the honeysuckle. But basically, bee balm is a great uh, plant to have around, not only for the hummingbirds. If you have bee balm, you will 
has hummingbirds, I, I promise you. But honey, um, honeybees love the bee balm as well. It's a good plant to have. And then this is an interesting, um, it's a very old fashioned, does anybody know this one? Borage? Yes, borage. It's a great plant to have uh, in your garden. Um, it provides lots of nectar for a long time. It's a very hardy plant and it grow, blooms way into the fall. Um, and provides nectar for the fall uh, to, for the bees to fill their winter stores after the harvest. Then they are left to their own devices and we hope that the sun is out and it's warm still and there are flowers still. And borage is one of those flowers you want to uh, have around. Okay, well, now it's end of July. So there are three, no actually this is beginning, uh, end of June. Um, Three extra boxes um, put on uh, the colony, and it's time to check out uh, what the status is, the honey uh, status. So I prepare for inspection, and this is what I need. I, of course, I have my. I don't have a bee suit and all that stuff. I just have my jeans or farmer's pants and an old white shirt for my husband with long sleeves and. I wear those uh, uh, vinyl gloves. I don't, I don't like those big bulky bee gloves. It's something that you can use. Um, and you have the veil, of course, and you have a hive tool. You need to have a hive tool, which is something to pry the frames of honeycomb apart. Because bees not only collect pollen and nectar uh, from the flowers and water uh, from the puddles for the hive. Uh, they, they also uh, collect the resin from the buds and bugs of trees. And they make it their own resin and it's called propolis. And that propolis is antiseptic. It keeps the hive antiseptic. It, it kills germs. It kills, it kills virus and fungus and bacteria. And um, they put it at the entrance of the hive, so the bees have to walk over it. This is why it's called propolis. It's propolis, it's a Greek word, in front of the city. Yeah. So uh, beekeepers know uh, the value of propolis. Uh, they scrape the hive, um, scrape it off the frames of the hive, and I chew, we chew it in my family. We chew it when we feel a cold coming or a sore throat coming. We chew it uh, the night before and, and, and it kills the germs in your throat. It, it's, it's great stuff. Uh, uh, so, um, but everything which wiggles and is loose, they glue tight with that propolis. So you cannot just lift the hive uh, top off. You have to pry it off because it's glued by the, with the propolis to the hive body. So you need the hive tool. You need smoke. Beekeepers use smoke to, to calm the bees down. Uh, the bees think there's a, a fire, and uh, if there's a fire, you flee. That's what the bees think. So, also, so um, the smoke makes the bees go around engorging themselves with honey because they think eventually they might have to move the, uh, leave the hive. And uh, so, but they, need to get food along with them. Like when we go on a hike, we take sandwiches along because it will take them a long time to, to establish a new hive, to gather food. So they engorge themselves with the honey so that they can start right away building on their nest uh, with that energy the honey provides. So, but of course we don't go and give them that much. And, and this, uh, they get so preoccupied with this engorging, and engorging themselves with honey makes them also kind of like you are after a big Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, I don't feel like you the dishes, or whatever that. So, so they sort of, it, uh, um, um, they don't get bothered as much when you use smoke on them. Here's the smoker. This is with a can with a bellow, and you make a fire in that can. So here I removed the top cover 
pierce the inner cover. I remove the inner cover, look down um, through the combs of the top super, the top high body eyelid. I pull one of those frames out and can you see? Now this is nice honey. So what the bees are doing, they collect nectar and they put the nectar in a special place in their belly, which is the honey stomach. It's not their regular stomach. It's, and in that place, they add an enzyme which splits the sucrose in the nectar into glucose and fructose, almost 50-50. And there are minor sugars also. But basically, it breaks the sucrose down into smallest building blocks, so uh, glucose and fructose. And then they, then they bring it home, they put it into the honeycomb cells, and then they stand over the cells and fan their wings, evaporating the water from the nectar until the nectar is concentrated, until there's only 18% water left in the nectar, and then it has become honey. And then they put a layer of wax over the honey for safekeeping because that is their winter food. They don't want to get stuck in it until they need it in the winter time. So here you see this is honey which is ripe. It's done. This honey needs a little bit more work. So the beekeepers harvest the honey, then this entire comb is covered with a layer of wax. Then it's good. If you harvest it before, there are certain circumstances where you harvest it before, but in general, you, you don't because you don't want to have more water in the honey. You only want 18.6% water maximum. Otherwise, the, the honey is too dilute and uh, yeasts will grow in it and the honey will ferment and will go bad. Honey never goes bad. Pure honey never will go bad if you keep the jar closed. So don't put the honey from the jar into a container like a jam uh, and, and then leave it on your counter. It will attract the water from the, the air and will dilute and then it will go bad. As long as the jar is closed, the honey never will go bad. All honey will crystallize at one point. Fall honey usually crystallizes earlier. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Never put the honey in the refrigerator because then it will crystallize faster or if you want to, you just want to do it up. But you don't need to put the honey in the refrigerator. So if you have crystallized honey, you can put it in a warm water or so. But eat it anyway, this is it's nice. So. Um, so this needs a little bit more work. I pull out another frame or oh, that needs a lot of work. But here you see the bees just, just start to put a lid of wax over the honey. It's beautiful. So this is the queen excluder I was telling you about, where the queen doesn't fit through. So the season goes on. Um, this is the arts like clover, Swedish clover, a great nectar source. Oh, it's wonderful. It has this very uh, distinct smell. Uh, if you have Swedish clover around, you will smell it. Um, very nice. Great nectar source, beautiful honey. And then you have the white clover. Uh, great honey from the white clover. And I'm lucky I live in the center of Bedford and close to the soccer fields and football fields. And there has a lot of clover in there. And the town waters it. So it's endless supply of nectar. As long as uh, the sun is shining, I get nice clover nectar for my bees. And then um, it is now middle of July, and years ago, the next beautiful mm, nectar flow was from the purple rose flower. All beekeepers used to love the purple rose flower, and we are all heartbroken because purple rose flower is deep an uh, invasive plant, and we beekeepers think. Uh, if purple loose type is an invasive, I think we are invasive too. Mm -hmm. We are just heartbroken over uh, the state uh, decided to distribute, um, let some beetles uh, into the purple loose type, which feeds off the seed parts and leaves of it. And so by now, 
the Pilbaruza is mostly gone. Uh, it was a beautiful plant to tie the bees over. Um, after all the summer blossoms uh, were done blooming, uh, the trees were blooming, uh, done blooming in the beginning and middle of the summer, uh, they are sort of a dearth. And the purple loose drive took over, filled this, this void. And the bees made beautiful honey. Dark, beautiful, full flavored honey from it. So, A purple large draft thistle, a nice uh, plant uh, later in the summer for the bees to go to. Uh, and now you see that bees have, I put five extra boxes. So each box has about um, 25 to 30 pounds of honey. I had a year like this last year. It was unbelievable. It was just, it was very nice. Last year was a great year for me. So now it's time to harvest. Um, I uh, put my pan, farmer's pants on, white shirt, or the long sleeve shirt, or whatever. I, I uh, smoke the bees with my smoker at the bottom to calm them down, and then I pull out the honeycomb and see what a beautiful comb that is. See the white cappings of wax. It's a beautiful frame of, uh, of honey. I just take a gentle brush and brush the bees off, and then put the uh, comb without the bees into an empty box, and I do this with all the honeycombs. And then I bring them to my honey house, and this is, it was still brown hairish <laughs> there. Uh, so, and as beekeepers, you have to lift and pull uh, some pounds, and it keeps you young. It really does. It's great. Uh, no osteoporosis for me. Uh, it, uh, and they in Germany, they say beekeepers live long and healthy lives because they inhale the bees' air. When you open the hive, you inhale. It's nice and pheromones. So yeah, I bring it to, so you, I'm lugging there, you know, um, like uh, 300 pounds, 20, 50 pounds of honey. And that when Elizabeth, the one who had a baby just now, she always helped me uh, harvesting the honey. And her job was it always to uh, get rid of the cappings of the honey, to decap the honey. So you have a sort of a metal comb, you go underneath the cappings and lift them off. And then uh, here is the comb without the cap, you see the honey in the comb. And then you put the uh, frame of honey into a centrifuge. And then you crank and crank and crank and crank and it gets hot. You cannot open a window because if you open a window, all the bees in the neighborhood will come <laughs> into the honey house and rob you of the honey, and it's a disaster. And so, so if you cannot even the storm wind, you cannot uh, scream, you cannot yell the window. So afterwards, we always went ice cream. So anyway, that <laughs> spin the honey out. It's, the honey spins out, runs down the wall of the centrifuge. Uh, through a sieve, just a regular sieve, into a bucket. And then you fill that bucket of honey through a very fine cloth into another bucket. And then you let it sit for a couple of days so all the bubbles uh, go um, uh, to the top and then you fill it into bottles. And here's honey, the first honey of the year. And then I also make honeycomb, which is wonderful, um, honey untouched by human hands. And uh, you, know, you, cut the, you cut the comb into squares and put it into a nice container. And, uh, and when I have it and sell it, people say, oh, when I was a kid, my grandfather, he used to have that. And he used to eat the honeycomb this way. It's great. You just take a chunk of comb. Uh, chew it, suck out the honey, chew the wax, spit it out or swallow it, doesn't matter. It's inert. Um, you can put the 
honeycomb wax and all and a hot piece of toast, it's wonderful. Or you can eat it on top of a warm brie cheese. <laughs> and then it all ends up in my honey house and on fairs. And so now the honey is harvested and now the bees will need to fill their honey stores for the winter. And uh, I hope that the fall has lots of sun, some rain, some warmth, um, so the bees can fly out and, and fill up their winter stores. And this allium is a great uh, uh, nectar source in the fall for the bees. And then, of course, this the sedum. The sedum, if you have sedum by your entrance door, uh, people get scared because <laughs> there are all these bees uh, under sedum. But again, they are just out for the nectar, unless you slap at them, they, they are not bothered by you. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily have them close by your entrance door because your skirt might go by and might get caught. Um, a hydrangea. These like to go to the hydrangea, and you will see them in the hydrangea in the fall. Different types of hydrangea. And then comes the last big nectar flow that is all for the bees to, to harvest and forage in are the asters, the numerous asters. And there are so many different types of asters, wonderful. And when you go through fields in the fall, you can see them harvesting. And then the golden rods, and the golden rods are wonderful. Uh, you would see the most beautiful wasps on the golden rods. Um, if you have a feed of golden rods on the edge of the soccer fields or so, check it out and on a warm fall day, what different insects you see on those golden rods. Joe Piley, myself, doing some artichokes. Hyssop. And jewelry. Now in the fall, uh, in the summer, the bees don't pay attention to jewelry that much. But in the fall, the jewelry, uh, even though they are so delicate, they bloom way into the fall. And that's when you see honeybees in the jewelry. Uh, because they are not, not much eggs anymore. And then Halloween comes and the first kill of frost. Uh, uh, Blossoms are dead. The bees are really now by themselves. There's no honey anymore uh, made. Uh, I will decrease the entrance of the hive so uh, because now the nights are getting colder and mice might try to get into the hive because it's nice and warm. The bees start to cluster up and there's lots of room uh, where the mice can go and snakes and so forth. So I decrease the entrance so the guard bees can guard that entrance better, better. And this is also the time when the drones are being kicked out. Now, as I was telling you, the drones only function is to mate with the queen. To meet the queen somewhere, and the queen, when she gets born, she will go out on her virgin flight, and she will go to a place where all the drones of the neighboring neighborhood, there's a congregate, there's a place where they like to congregate. And all the queens of the neighborhood will fly by and will mate with the drones. They will mate with a few drones, so they have quite an assembly of uh, 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 sperm in, uh, uh, to give to the queen. And then the queen flies back and she will start laying eggs. Now this is the only time the drone, that's the only function of the drone. And all drones, not all drones, will get to mate with the queen. So those are the drones which come back to the hive and they hang around all summer long. They cannot feed themselves. Their mouth is not built in such a way that they can gather food for the winter so they don't either. They get fed by the bees. They hang around there and get, tell the other bees, feed me, feed me, feed me. And the other bees will feed the drones all through the summer. But then in the fall, the bees say, hey, drone, by the way, oh, they don't have a stinger either, so they cannot guard the hive. So the bees say, by the way, you never guarded our hive. 
You never collect any food for the winter, and we need to feed you. Uh -uh, no deal. So they kick the drones out. They sting them to death. They don't feed them anymore. They starve to death. And the drone, I know, the bees are getting ready for the winter. The drone battles have started. And I see piles of dead drones in front of the hive. And the yellow jackets have a feast. They come and they clean it up. So the nights get cold, um, the queen stops laying, I wrap some tarp around my hives to, to protect them a little bit from the cold wind. I storm, they keep warm inside, and next year a new year will start. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
while losing the ones which don't have uh, the resistance. So, yeah, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. Excuse me, could you spell that Cameroon? Yeah, I M D A C L P R I D. Yes. Do you need a minimum amount of acreage to have a, a beehive? No, not at all. I mean, uh, there's a guy in Belmont, he has this tiny, tiny little backyard. Um, uh, I, we have just a, a little less than an acre um, in my house. Uh, no, you don't. But what you, if you have a very small yard, you can have a hive there. But you want the bees to, when they fly, you don't want them to just fly out like this and there might be a walkway where people walk. So you might want to put some something which makes the bees go up, like a hedge or, or some, some bush or shrub, you know. So it forces them to go up right away so they don't bump into people. Um, so, but, you know, I'm, I have neighbors and, and nobody minds. In the beginning, I must admit, my neighbor was a little leery, uh, and uh, she came to me that fall. She came to me and said, Kelly, ever since you have the bees, I have so many bees. And she didn't like it. And I said, well, show me. And she had wasps. The, you know, people don't know the difference. And so she had yellow jackets. And what happens with the yellow jackets, the yellow jackets, like the bumblebees, um, their colony dies off in the fall with the first frost. So those uh, wasp nests you see, hornet's nests and wasps and yellow jacket and things hanging in the trees, for example, they are all empty, uh, dead. With the first frost, they all die. The queens bury themselves in the ground. Bumblebees the same way. They, bury, they hibernate. And then in the springtime, they fly out and start building a new nest. And the, for example, the big bumblebees you see, they're all in the springtime, they're bumblebee queens trying to find a new nesting site. Or the big wasps you see, they're all queens starting to be. And that is a good time then, I shouldn't be saying this, but to, to look around where you're typically in a wasp nest, like underneath your picnic, they're under you, underneath your porch floor. You know, have a look there early in the springtime, whether you see a queen building on a few of those cells, and that's the time to go But the wasps don't eat mosquitoes. You don't want to have them close to you now. Well, you know, that is... I, I don't know whether the mosquitoes are not too many for the wasps. What about the location for the hive? Is there an ideal location in your yard as far as... Yeah, you want to have, uh, ideally, face it east, so they get the first sun rays. But they need also shade. It doesn't need to be the bright sun. Uh, it's nice to have some shade. Uh, but to get the morning sun, that is nice, yes. Well, last year I went to a beekeeping lecture, and I believe someone said to help control the mites on the bees, they were um, pouring um, or shaking. Oh, the sugar? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Is that a yeah. common thing? Uh, yeah, that is one of the tricks um, um, beekeepers do, mm -hmm. because the powdered sugar, uh, uh, the, the mites cannot hold on to the body of the bees with this powder on them, uh, <laughs> so they fall off. And, uh, Would that change the consistency of the honey somehow? No, no, they just clean it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you know about municipal spraying? I, I um, I'm a, a beginner beekeeper. I'm a, a yeah. Half market. Yeah. And I saw the behavior you talked about, where I saw them drunk on the asphalt on the driveway. I'm pretty far set back from the street, and I called, and it's my gut that they did spray within a couple of days. I'm here in the town of Berlin. Uh, supposedly, it doesn't harm the bees. If you uh, if you call and you uh, are alerted that uh, that there is a spray on a beekeeper and I call and they'll they'll avoid it. They'll so we'll put the you can put your disc on your mailbox. Saying.
Oh, that's, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can do it, but you have to be vigilant. Yeah, but I think it's supposedly it's not harmful to produce. I think the drunkenness they must be, might have gotten into neonicotinoids. Yeah. Yes. Um, about how much does it cost to get started in the uh, uh, I would say two hundred dollars. If you oh, a little be? bit over hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what that would get give you get your uh, starting, <coughs> which is a high. It gets you the smoker, it gets you the veil. Um, um, Man Lake would be a company to look up on the internet. Man, M-A-N-N, -N, I think it's a lake, L-A-K-E. Thank you very much um, for listening. Here's my little book, I donated to the library. <laughs> it tells you, let me tell you about my bees. It's, people always ask me what the bees are doing and what I do the bees when I meet them in town. So I decide to write an article every month about exactly that. And people stop me in the street, they love it. And so I put it on the little book. So it tells you, if you have an inkling maybe someday, you would like to become a teacher, but this is a nice start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.